And welcome everyone to our Relax and Rise Up session today. Whether you are just starting out your school year or you're getting back into the swing of things after the holidays, it's totally normal to feel a little overwhelmed. Homeschool parents often have big dreams for their children and for themselves as parents, and it can be hard living up to those expectations. So if you have ever felt inadequate to educate your own children, overwhelmed, fearful of making mistakes, failing your kids, or you're just plain exhausted, we are here to help you. I am Sunny, Sunlight's community manager and a Sunlight mom of two, and joining me today are Judy, Lisa, and Amber. So we're going to start with some introductions. Judy, do you want to tell us a little bit more about you? Good morning, Sunny. I'm glad to be here. I am a Sunlight Marketing Sales Manager and also a Sunlight mom of three amazing kids who have gone on, um, graduated from high school, graduated from college, and now we have a second generation of Sunlighters in our family. Um, so pretty excited to be here to share today. Great. And Lisa, you want to tell us a little bit more about you? I'm Lisa. I am a retired homeschool mom. I graduated two children, two of my three children through our homeschool uh, using Sunlight the whole time. And I enjoy helping new homeschool families as a mentor mom over on the app and in Facebook. So I'm just excited to be here today. Great. Thank you. Amber, you want to go ahead and tell us about you? Yeah, I am Amber Severance and I work for Sunlight as a consultant at conventions. Um, I have five children and I've graduated three of them through uh, my homeschool and have used Sunlight all the way through. I still have a junior in high school and I have a sixth grade girl. So still in the thick of it, but also can kind of see the end of the end of the tunnel too. <laughs> Well, perfect. Thank you so much for being here and sharing your expertise with us. And to those of you already commenting in the chat, thank you so much. Tell us where you're joining in from. And if you have any questions, make sure you put those in there as well. And we'll do our best to answer as much as we can for you. So let's get started with getting back into the groove of school. In January, sometimes people are starting a new year or they're in the middle of their year, but they're having to get back into it after a holiday or an extended break. And sometimes you don't want to, or your kids don't want to get back to school after that break. So what are some ideas for easing back into a school routine? Well, uh, for me, I think one of the things that I, try to do is that first week we're getting back into it, I really focus on the um, main subjects. So if I have to ease into it, which I often will, because it's really hard for all of us to just dive in, um, the math, the science, the history, the language arts, those four I try to, to be more faithful to and some of the extras or even history I might set aside for a day or two because I know often I could double up on that subject. Um, especially with my elementary. So that's one way that I try to, to cope. We uh, used to focus on grace a lot those first <laughs> few weeks. Um, and so I, I had to tell myself it was okay not to expect everybody to be in the same schedule that we left before the holidays. Um, I also, um, we live in upstate New York, so couldn't always get outside, but as often as I could, if we got antsy mid-morning or whatever, just having trouble sitting still for any length of time, we would look for ways to get outside or to burn energy or to do something that was a distraction. I really um, tried to set ourselves up for success the first or the days leading up to coming back to school. So getting back to a bedtime routine, getting back to a morning routine, trying to curb some of the screen time maybe, or that kind of thing, just to get us back in the mindset of a schedule, um, mm -hmm. both for myself and for my kids, because moms get out of schedule too. We, we relax, read extra books, spend extra time on Instagram or whatnot. So just a few days before trying to reestablish a little bit of a schedule. You know, the other thing I think is really helpful too, to remember it's a process and um, I'm not going to make or break my homeschool on the week after, you know, sometimes we're so intent, like, oh my word, my kid's not going to get into college because in second grade, we didn't do as much school as we could possibly do in that one. So anyway, just kind of um, being a little bit kind and gracious with ourselves too, to, to remember that this is a, it's a process and it's okay. 
Yeah, that is great advice. I know for me personally, and I kind of do it throughout the year too, because there's always times kids are unmotivated or I'm unmotivated. I'll grab the stack of books of what I want to accomplish and I set them on the table and I kind of let the kids choose what they want to do first or, you know, what are we going to save for the end? Um, because then I find they usually get more excited and they're more engaged about it. Mm -hmm. And that way I know too, if we didn't get to something today, we can always do it tomorrow. Uh, the other thing I like to do is we kind of keep the read alouds going even over the breaks because that doesn't feel like true academics or, <laughs> you know, schoolwork. So they're already in the routine of that. So usually our first week or two back, it might be like, OK, we've done read aloud. How about we read some history together now or let's do a math lesson, you know, those types of things to kind of get kids back in gear. And I love Amber and uh, Judy, especially what you guys said about grace and cutting yourself some slack. It does not have to be perfect ever, but especially when you're getting back into that routine. Um, and I know at the beginning of a school year, we always recommend getting organized, you know, building your IGs, getting your books all organized on the shelf. If you started school several months ago, though, and you're kind of in the middle of the year, do you think there's any value in reorganizing or storing away any materials that you're not going to use right now? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, one of the things, um, we live in a part of the country where winter is long. Um, and one of the things that we often would do in our household is rearrange a room. We were in so inside so much of the time that after a while, cabin fever is a really, truly real thing. And so one of my solutions to that was, okay, let's change the living room around or let's do something fun in your bedroom. And the same thing was true for my homeschool. If I could maybe um, switch up something or hang a new poster near where we were doing some work or um, take out all the read alouds that we had read before Christmas and say, wow, look at all these books that we read and set them aside and just kind of look at them for a few days and say, we did a lot of work and, and that would motivate us for the coming year. But yes, do something to change the scenery wherever it is you do school, whether it's in your living room or at your dining room table or multiple places, change the scenery somehow. Yeah, I think that's great advice. Um, Sunny, I don't know if we want to grab, I, I'm looking at a question over here about <laughs> doing school through the summer. And I think that's a great question at this moment because of what we're talking about there there are uh, like a million different opinions about that i think probably every, there might be every mother so i'm just going to give my opinion this is just for me for what's worked for us i don't do school in the summer i i, I every summer i have grand intentions of let's keep up with math through the summer let's but full disclosure it never happens it doesn't matter what i do but for me i've always needed a break in the summer i just i, I can't do it i i need a couple months to, to just set it aside and refresh and, you know, do some projects in my house that I can't get to. None of my children have suffered from that. Um, but again, that's, that's from my, from my experience. Um, if you know, you have a child that, that couldn't handle being away from, you know, so do some math worksheets, whatever. But I just, for anybody out there who's feeling guilty that they don't do summer school in the summer, that's not me. I, I, I can't do the year round thing. I've yeah. I just wanted to address that. that <laughs> yeah, no, and that is a great question. Um, and for me, I've never officially schooled in the summer either, although that is kind of my cushion or my buffer is what I use it as. So your Sunlight IG comes with 36 weeks, but there's 52 weeks in a year. So don't feel like you have to start, you know, today's my first day of school and I have to get it all done in 36 weeks. Um, and to let you guys in on what's going on in my own life, my daughter is very independent and does a lot of things on her own, but my son is still at an age where we have to do all of the reading with him. And so I started both kids at the same time, but my son is about five or six weeks behind in his IG over my daughter just because she's been working ahead, but he is relying on his dad and I to read things to him, but that's okay. I don't worry about, you know, are we going to end the school year at the same time? No, because I have a full calendar year. So 
what that means is my daughter will finish her year earlier and then, you know, she can relax and read for fun. And my son will still have, you know, some more school. And I just keep going until his IG is done. So yeah, you don't have to feel like you have to do it in the summer, but I kind of use that as my buffer to feel like it's okay <laughs> if I get a little behind or if I need a break in the middle of the year and, you know, I can take that break and it's fine because I still have that time. Uh, Judy, Lisa, did you guys educate in the summer or did you take a big break like Amber does or what did you guys do? In elementary school, we did go through the summer. I live in Florida, was often 106 degrees outside. And so we didn't want to be outside. And if you're going to be inside, we were going to be productive. Now, that doesn't mean that we started at eight o'clock and checked every box, but we did want to be productive. Um, I found that my kids thrived on structure. And so when we just totally blew off everything, it was chaotic. Um, I thrive on structure. So we needed to have something, but our motto was always, we're going to do school unless something better comes up. So if a friend with a pool invited us over, we grabbed our swimsuits, dropped the books, and went over. You know, if someone was staying at the beach for a week and invited us to come down and spend the night, we packed our suitcase. It wasn't a big deal. But because, like you said, Sunny, we have only 36 weeks of curriculum, but 52 weeks in the year. And really, who's to say you can't take 54 weeks, you know? Um, we were never behind. We were just where we were. And so we did do some work over the summer, but it wasn't um, militant. We didn't start school at eight o'clock and end at three o'clock. And we chunked it up because I really bought into the, I've got 52, year, 52 weeks to do this year. And so we would actually um, take almost a whole month off at Christmas time. Um, <clears throat> we would take some time off in the summer but we never did our family vacation until the end of September because by then everybody else was back in school and there were no lines to wait for whatever ride or um, there was more room on the beach. And <clears throat> so where, wherever we wanted to go, we would do that in late September. So we would take our summer vacation um, in the fall. So we used the entire year and I would look at my calendar and what do we have to do this year? Where do I have to go? Where, where do we need to be? And we would schedule school in around it. Yeah, I think you all brought up points about how it is flexible. You as the homeschool parent get to decide what works best for your family and it may change from year to year and as your kids age. And so that is so true. We have a great uh, question from Melissa too about Sunlight Connections our in-person groups. Um, and she's saying that uh, people live a little further away um, and so they don't want to join a group because it's further away. Um, and so she's asking, you know, what types of things she should do to get people to join members or get new members. Uh, for those of you that are not aware, we do have Sunlight Connections in-person groups. So you definitely want to check out the map if you're interested in more of a co-op meet uh, field trip type group. Um, and reach out to that leader to find out, you know, what activities are going on. Um, she suggested Zoom meetings as well, uh, field trips once a month. I, Melissa, I think those are great ideas. Um, I think it really depends on who's in your area and what they want to do. Um, and I know, like, I am in South Denver, so there are activities that we would go to maybe downtown or down in Colorado Springs, but if they were too far north, uh, we may or may not do that. So depending on which metropolitan area you're in, uh, that I think would kind of depend, you know, who in your area wants to do things or if you're a little more on the outskirts, but I think Zoom is great. You know, interacting with people on Facebook is great or in our Sunlight app. Uh, where you can talk to people and give advice that may be a little closer and may be willing to meet up every once in a while. The rest of you ladies, what ideas do you have for Melissa, either for getting members involved or maybe things she can do in her connections group? Well, I would probably ask um, the people who were interested in my group, what works for you and what is it you're looking for in a group? Um, and then I would probably take those suggestions and see what you can come up with, because some people still are hesitant to do in-person type meetings, but Zoom would be a great opportunity for people to 
you know, chat and talk about what's going on in their homeschool. So like you said, lots of options. And I think if you feel like people are spread out, maybe if you went to once a month or once a quarter, maybe people would be willing to travel. And then if you got invested in relationships, maybe the distance wouldn't be so much um, as you progressed through. Um, but, but maybe lowering your expectation of how often you wanted to meet in person um, and then maybe people would be willing to come out. And then maybe next time they had so much fun, they brought a friend who, you know, maybe you could find a group here and a group there based on that. But I think it just takes time. People have to invest in in relationship. And like Judy said, there is still some hesitancy to meet face to face. But um, we're so fortunate that that we are in this time of technology that we can be close and still be not close proximity wise. Yeah, that's so true. I mean, just like today, you know, we're all on the computer and I know uh, when COVID first happened and everybody went into quarantine, my women's Bible study started meeting over Zoom. And that now is our great backup when somebody's feeling sick or doesn't feel comfortable meeting, you know, for those types of activities. So I think that's a great idea. Um, also, someone has asked a question about homeschool enrichment programs through the public school yes or no should your kids do those things but if there's an opposing world view um i would say the first thing because i'm in colorado you have to check the legality in your state and how you're doing it because i use a cover school over 50 percent of the instruction has to be at home so some of those options like a public school enrichment are not even something that we can consider um but as far as like you know if you do have that option and you want to do that. Ladies, I'll let you jump in first with your thoughts on that and then I'll, I'll wrap that one up. <laughs> what do you well, think? I just think like all things, um, you have to be involved and aware. And so um, if you want to take advantage of something like that, you, you know, go for it, but just pay attention. <laughs> like we have to with everything. I, I think I have for for me personally, we moved a lot. So it was hard for me to to get involved in those sorts of things. I felt like we had, well, I had five children, you know, and so at one point, you know, five children under the age of 12, um, we had enough going on that I did not need to reach out for that extra enrichment. I haven't, for my family, I haven't noticed a ton, especially young, that I really needed to do extra with that sort of thing. There was enough enrichment coming through um, church or the library or other things that I, I didn't feel the need to get involved in all of that. For our family, um, I sent one child through the public school system and that's why I homeschooled the other two. So for me, um, there was nothing that the public school could offer enrichment wise that we couldn't do no. just as well or better at home. That is not a judgment against someone who did choose to use that. It just was not something our family was interested in um, a lot because it was a schedule that tied us to a yeah. schedule. If you yeah. commit to being in a Spanish class at school, you're committing to whatever time that is and that reduces the ability to go to a theme park when the lines are low or to take off and visit a relative or whatever. So just for us, that was not something that we were looking for. We did do a co-op of other homeschool families and um, it wasn't as big a deal if you missed. And it was only one day a week versus probably what I would assume is three or four days a week at a public school. So yeah. for us, that was our consideration. Um, but again, not a judgment. If, if that is something if you have a weak spot in your homeschool or a real your child just really wants to do something and that's a way that you can provide it and it works for your family's calendar and beliefs and schedule and all the things then sure take advantage of it you know that's the beauty of what we're doing we get and it doesn't have to be the same for sally that it is for susie you know just because child number one did something that doesn't mean everyone else does it next you know it's case by case that's so good yeah that's exactly you have to decide what your family needs and regardless of what anyone else says about enrichment programs you have to make the decision for your family 
Yeah, absolutely. I agree with that. Um, and I know at one time we did, when my daughter was younger, we had a private school that offered a homeschool academy. It was a private Christian school and they offered like art and music and gym class and maybe some of those fun things about school that are not academic. Um, they didn't do any academic stuff with the kids, but that way homeschooled kids that maybe were missing out on those fun things. Um, if your kids are like mine, when my kids were little, they wanted to go to school to eat in the cafeteria and ride the school bus and, you know, play sports, but that was it. So that was a good uh, program at the time when the kids were little because they got to do those things, you know, the fun parts of school. Then as they got older, they realized the advantages to homeschooling as far as, you know, sleeping in, doing work in your pajamas, like they no longer thought that riding a bus would be that fun anymore. Um, and so now we no longer do anything like that. So it really just kind of depends like what you ladies said on the needs of your family. Um, and then as far as opposing worldviews, if your children are around other kids, they will hear opposing worldviews no matter what situation yeah. you're in. So be aware of what they're being exposed to regardless and and just stay in touch with that. Uh, one of my favorite things about homeschooling is that you are with your kids so much and you have those natural conversations that fall into the day. So it's, I think, easier to keep a pulse on what's going on and their friendships and everything else. Um, but yeah, just be aware of your own kids and decide what you think is best. Uh, Sarah is asking if we fly through curriculum midway through the year, do we move on to the next level or just review and take uh, time off? She said, for example, we're using another math and we'll be done in late February. Do we move forward or do we wait till fall? Move forward. It's math. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Short answer, move definitely, forward. <laughs> definitely move, especially with a skill-based subject. Yes. You want to keep yeah. the skill going because I'll tell you, you might fly through this year, but there will come a time where it is not so easy and you will hit the proverbial brick wall and yeah. there will need yeah. to be instruction and review and all of those things. So, yeah. yeah. Definitely just keep moving at your child's pace. Reading. Funny, funny. Oh, sorry, Judy, go ahead. Reading, math, language arts, any of those skill-based subjects, like Lisa said, you don't, you don't want to put the brakes on. You really right, don't. but I was going to say on the flip side, I see a comment from Michelle. The last line is, I am so overwhelmed. So I just wanted to briefly grab hers. Um, she's feeling stressed because they're doing D and E and have had long breaks and she's only on week 11 and says, I'm, I feel like we're behind. I'm not sure how to do this. So I, I just want to take a second to encourage her because um, if we're talking about the history portion or even the science portion um, I'm going to validate the feeling behind and feeling overwhelmed and feeling like you're behind. Oh, my word, I'm going to ruin my children or something. Um, can I just assure you that that's not the case? And um, with history, I mean, week 11, that's great. You've done 11 weeks of history. It's OK. Um, nobody is saying you have to be at this point at this time. Um, you can skip a book or two. Um, I have done that before when I found myself really far behind. I say, oh, look, here's a book that, um, you know what? I'm a full grown adult. As a matter of fact, I just did this with my son. OK, this is high school, but the book is Contiki. It's a tough read and it has a lot of words on every page. And I just looked at that and I thought, you know what? I have not read Contiki. And I am a 51 year old adult woman. And I feel like I've lived a pretty full life without ever having read Contiki. Would it be okay if we just skip that one? And let's, there was another book I'd rather have him read or we just needed to jump. So anyway, my, my point in saying that is be kind to yourself. You're not gonna ruin them. You've already given them more probably than they would ever get in a traditional classroom, even by week 11. So, so keep moving on. It's okay. And, and see if there are some things that you can adjust in that history. It's, it's okay. It will come back around. It'll come yeah. back around. Yes. Because there is in a literature-based curriculum an inherent overlap. Yes. You're not just going to study George Washington once. You'll probably study him multiple times throughout the years. So if you skip a book this year about George Washington, you do not have to be afraid that there's this big George Washington shaped hole in your child's education because you will learn about him again. So 
you can't, every child is going to have gaps in their education. They are. Oh yeah. But like Amber said, we all had gaps in our education and we managed to do just fine. So yes, give yourself the freedom to say, I can't get this one done and put it on the shelf and move on. Yeah, you know, the I other thing that's true too is, oh, sorry. No, what I was going to say about this people, subject. Right? Yeah, I'm excited. Is that a lot of people stretch their HBL over two years sometimes. So you mm -hmm. don't feel like yes. when I say I like to do my 36 weeks and 52, you don't have to do that. If your child is not ready, you know, to do that, you can stretch it out over two years. You can do maybe a lower program and come back. Like it's totally fine because it is that literature base. <laughs> And I'm and sorry, there, Lisa, are, <laughs> there are no sunlight police that are going to <laughs> pop into your schoolroom and say, what week are you on? Um, there, ju there just aren't. So also, I think we have this false sense of pressure that, oh, if my son were in uh, traditional school. So even she's saying, like, I'm, I'm so afraid that he's not going to be ready for high school. But being ready for high school doesn't mean that you know everything and that you've covered every single thing. It, it, that's not what being ready for high school is. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's part of it. And I, and I like to tell people this in the booth too, that if you moved from school district to school district, uh, like if you make a move from New York to California to Michigan at any time during your child's education, you're going to enter a school and you will have already covered U.S. history, but they're teaching it next year. Like the, it's just different, right? So we need to allow ourselves that that same kind of mentality in our homeschool also, that it's not going to be, yeah. yeah. And, and also guys, if you're excited about learning with your kids and reading, they're gonna pick a subject that they get so excited about and they're gonna do it on their own. They're gonna read it later. Maybe when, you know, for my boys, when their brains actually turn on again at like 16, 17, <laughs> after you get through the, yeah. I always said, as long as I taught my girls how to learn, I didn't have to teach them everything Yes, because when they wanted to learn it, they knew how. And yeah. so they would go and do it because at whatever age I am today or tomorrow or the next day, I don't know everything. I learn something every day because I love to learn. And if you make your home a place where learning is valued and um, accepted and pursued, they will be lifelong learners. And so you, there no more pressure. You don't have to teach them everything. They'll figure out what they need to know. Here's, here's the other thing that goes along with what Lisa's saying. My husband asks me all the time when I'm feeling this way, what is the point of education? Mm -hmm. Okay. So the point of education is not to get them ready for high school and to get them ready for the point of education is to learn and to love learning. And if I'm learning, but I'm only on week 11, okay, you're learning. Um, so, yeah, that is so true. We have a couple of questions now about uh, homeschooling with multiple kids. We yeah. have one saying, uh, does anyone work a little like with their kindergartner or their younger children in the summer? So they have one on one and then the older kids more on a traditional school schedule. And then Jessica is saying she has a ninth grader, a sixth grader, a third grader, and a preschooler. So yeah. with the ages of her kids, she's got that wide age gap. So how, what are some ways for you know teaching multiple kids? Do you have to do them all at the same time? Or do you split it up like that? Well, depending on the ages of your children, your older children should be moving more and more toward independence. So if you have an older child that's junior high age, high school age, um, your role becomes more of a coach and a, and a check-in kind of person. And um, your desire is to make sure they continue to learn and keep moving, but you're not going to educate them the same way that you're going to educate your second grader uh, because your second grader needs that face-to-face, one-on-one instruction and assistance in learning and your high schooler shouldn't, your junior high schooler sh shouldn't. And our ultimate goal is to uh, cut those apron strings and let them go and be independent. So the more you can teach them independence at home, um, the better prepared they're going to be when they do leave your home because they will leave one day. It may not feel like it today um, or even next year, but they will leave. 
And so that that is your ultimate goal is to churn out independent adults who can, you know, step into society and make their own mark. All that to say, if you focus on those younger children and just come alongside and check in with your older students periodically throughout the week, that really does lighten the load significantly so that you have time for those younger children. Yeah, and I lightly touched on that when I was talking about where my kids are in their IGs. My daughter is in middle school, and so she does a lot of her work on her own, and then I check in with her um, at the end of the day, and it takes maybe 20 or 30 minutes to, I ask her the IG questions over her history, I check her math, I check her science worksheets, we do our read aloud together still, but pretty much everything else is on her own. Um, and then my son, because he's much younger and, and barely reading fluently, you know, we have to do a lot of that stuff with him. Um, so I kind of, my husband and I take a tag team approach because we both also work from home. Uh, so we're usually working during the day. And then in the afternoon, we grab everything and we say, okay, which child do you want to work with? And we kind of switch on and off like that um, because that's what works for us. Um, but we are often doing school afternoon and evening um, around the dinner table. That's a big school time for us. So I know that's not something that a lot of people naturally think of. They think of homeschooling as all being during the day, um, but you don't have to do it that way. Um, if you have a family of night owls, do it at, at night before bed. Those read alouds make great bedtime stories. So you kind of have to look at your family's dynamic. Do you have help, you know, in the form of a spouse who wants to help with science experiments or reading? You know, do you have somebody maybe that can watch your littles while you're working with the older ones? Um, but I know at, at one time I had a, a little when my daughter was in school and I used to just wear him in a baby carrier and carry him around while I was working with her until she was on that independent track where now he's my focus. So it kind of depends on your kids needs at the time, I think. I'd love to jump in too, because I actually really lived this out. I'm, I'm thinking of this gal who said ninth grade. So I, I had at that time, ninth, seventh, fifth, third or second, um, and a baby. So I, I get the uh, multiples thing. I think one thing to remember too, you have to have a pretty significant structure to your day to accomplish what you need to with that many kids. So for me, as a mom, just giving myself over to the fact that this is my full-time job. This is my job, and I really have to be invested um, and, and organized. So that was one thing. Another thing, so I had a pretty good schedule going. We had half-hour increments and figuring out who was where. But when the older kids are doing their math, their language arts, things that I didn't need to be touching the, for the entire, you know, 40 minutes. That's when I was working with my littles or even that little kindergartner. Also, the kindergartner can get one-on-one -on -one attention from the older children if that's your home, which was, it could be in my situation. So my youngest would have playtime with the brother who wasn't too much older. They would have craft time with someone. They would have reading. Someone else would read to them. So they were getting one-on-one -on -one not it doesn't all have to be mom that gets the one on one does that make sense so i did have time one on one we would snuggle and read while the other kids were doing something else and if that meant we sat on my bed to read because the dining room table was whatever so the least distraction but there are ways to get that done i feel like we could talk about that for a long time but those are hopefully just a couple little practical things I think I another that's... thing to take into account is maybe bedtime or after mm -hmm. dinner time where bigger kids can do independent reading or soccer practice or whatever it is that they do. And those littles go to bed. Um, they don't have to know that read aloud is yeah. school. You're just reading, you know, Charlotte's Web, a yeah. chapter a night right. or whatever right. um, before bed and you're checking it off. And again, um, those, like I say, I never taught my third child anything. Like she just knew yes. <laughs> because we were doing it already. And oh, I She's already exposed. know mom, when, when mm -hmm. E's at the end, he makes the other vowel say its name. Oh, okay. Yeah. So we got that down. What's next? Yeah. You know, um, she knew her multiplication way before 
age-wise before her sister, but at the same time her sister did because she heard us. So don't don't discount what your your little people are picking up as they're yep. just playing Barbie or trucks or blocks yeah. or whatever it is they're doing. Yeah. And Lisa, I would love to jump on that too and say, you know, God designed your family. Uh, he didn't make a mistake that that child is fourth and has three before them or four before them or six before them, whatever it is. He th That child is at that point in your family to learn other things than the first one who had all your attention for a little while can learn. My fifth child knows different things, has a different skill set than my firstborn, right? That it's, it, But that's I didn't pick that. I didn't pick for Stephanie to be born first and Julia to be born last. That's God. He gets to make that call. <laughs> and so then we, but like Lisa said, they're learning constantly. I always did read alouds at lunch so that I would have a time of non-conflict. Everybody's busy stuff in their face. And I read to this day. I still read my junior in high school and my sixth grader listen to me read every day at lunch. And my 11th grader will sit there and listen. He just loves it. And it's not even his read aloud. But, but using that time, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Um, also, we're getting some questions for people who are not as familiar with sunlight terminology or how you educate with sunlight. So if you guys can kind of explain, you know, how, what a typical day might look like with sunlight, what an IG is. We have a question on that. That's kind of our lingo that, yeah, if you're not familiar with sunlight, you may not be as aware of that. And then if you are new to homeschool, do you have to do you know, a very structured routine or kind of how do you start setting that up when you're using sunlight curriculum specifically? So an IG is an instructor's guide. It's just a handy way to abbreviate it. And literature-based learning basically means that we are um, dividing subjects in our curriculum into two categories. So we have what we call couch subjects and we have table subjects. Table subjects are easy to define. Think about the things you do at your dining room table. So those are skill-based subjects. Those are grade level subjects. Those are things like math and um, spelling and any, any subject where you are incrementally learning skills. And then couch-based subjects, those are the literature-based subjects like history and science and um, the readers and the read alouds. And that's where we learn by reading good books, biographies, historical fiction, instead of utilizing a textbook, um, because those books give context to the information that your children are learning in it. And it creates like this hook in their brain so that they remember, um, they get caught up in the context of the story and have a better opportunity to remember that information. That <clears throat> approach, that literature-based approach, those couch subjects is what allows us to say, you can teach multiple children at a time using our program because good literature is not written to a single age or grade. Um, Charlotte's Web that someone mentioned earlier is not just for second graders. Um, I know some adults who really enjoy that book and so if you've got kids that are within three or four years of age of one another, you can share history and share um, your science work together, the hands-on component and the literature component. That's what makes it so efficient a way to learn because you can share so many of the subjects. Yeah, that is so true. Um, and when I mentioned the read alouds, we like to do them as bedtime stories. They don't feel like you're learning or reading anything. Um, but it was funny because I asked my daughter just the other night what her favorite read aloud so far this year has been. And it was one about when cholera was discovered and like the source of cholera. And we read this novel about it. I was like, what cholera can be fun <laughs> like never would i have picked that as her favorite read aloud but hearing this fictional story based on you know the discovery of cholera and where it came from made it a more fun way for her to learn about that and she will retain that information so much better you know because she read it in literature as opposed to just you know a line item in a history book um and then those IGs, they are flexible. They are a guide. They will give you 
anything and everything <laughs> that you may need, but you don't, you're not a slave to your IG. You do not have to do everything in the IG. Um, there is so much there. You really do not need to supplement with sunlight, even if your child is very advanced and needs more work. But if you feel like it's too heavy, you can also cut out the things, you know, that are too much for your child. Um, and I know we've talked a lot about independence. What about, uh, we have some questions from people whose kids are about that middle school age, 12, 13, and they are not willing to do anything themselves. I know that's kind of a hard age personality wise in a lot of ways as well. So what are some ideas to get those, those kids that can be independent on that track? Hey, I noticed that comment too. And one thing I'd like to say is that I think that it was a boy who's 12 who's struggling to be independent. Okay, and again, I, you can't make a blanket statement because there are some 12 and 13 year old boys who are very driven, very kind of serious and just go get it. But um, my experience has been that uh, boys at that age, it's it's a struggle. So I, um, I have really, I had one son who's pretty motivated on his own, like he really liked to read and so he would, he would do that. But my second, no, not so much. And um, I had to motivate him. And for a little bit, I felt kind of guilty. But I had a longtime teacher, school teacher say to me, Amber, it's OK. Like, like, think of ways to reward him for the work he's doing. Right. So I think that could be one thing to kind of pray about. Is there a way that I can motivate him? So, no, you don't want it. And, and again, I, I'm. I guess I'm struggling to to know what independent work we're talking about. OK, so I should be able to say to my 12 year old son, here's your math lesson. Let me make sure you understand it. Um, and now I want you to sit and work and I'll set the timer for 15 minutes or 20 minutes. And I'm going to check in on you and see how far you've gotten. And then, you know, that same 12 year old wants to play the Xbox later or watch a video or do a Lego something. Um, guess what? That's my that's your time, but it's becoming my time because in the 30 minutes I had allotted for math, you didn't you didn't get it done. So so when it's time to play Legos or it's time to do the Xbox, you you get to come back and finish math. And I bet it will only take a couple days before he's decided that uh, during school time and math, he'll actually work for those 30 seconds. I mean, 30 minutes. So setting timers, I think sometimes for a I'm, I'm picturing myself as a 12 year old boy, just going, it's in eternity that you're asking me to sit here. So if I can set a timer and say, it's been 15 minutes and I'm gonna come back at the end of 15 minutes, you should be to this point and we'll recheck. So those, those might be some motivating things to do, but he's 12, he's not 24, he's 12. He might need his maturity and all of that. I don't care if every other 12 year old is your best friend down the street is here. Her 12 year old is blah, blah, blah. Who cares? They're not the same people. Don't compare. You know your son, but don't be afraid to give some motivation. Little gifts, little rewards, but then the timer there, there are things that can be done to help. I also think we need to teach children to be independent. I think um, I know for me, you know, my mom would say, go clean your room. Mm -hmm. Okay. That is a huge daunting thing to a kid. What does that mean? So yeah. when we say we want you to be independent, what does that mean? Even I want you to do your math by yourself. What does that mean? So I think um, we, like Judy was saying, we change from the face to face to the coach. I think that's where we start to change our role. And when we want our child to be independent, maybe it's a checklist. Maybe it's a timer, like Amber said. Maybe it's a, a block schedule, a planner, whatever. But yes. we can't just say, okay, today you're independent because you're, that's like Charlie Brown's teacher. Wah, 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 wah. <laughs> what does independent mean? So mm -hmm. here, here's today for independence. I want you to come to the instructor's guide, look at what you're supposed to read and go read it oh, okay, I can do that. And suddenly I'm independent. And then after we've mastered that, that's the first thing you do. What's the second thing you do? So baby steps toward independence. And then suddenly you wake up, you know, six months from now and it's like Sonny's daughter. Well, I'm three weeks ahead because yeah. I was able to 
to be. Yes, yeah, she wasn't doing that at seven, by the way. <laughs> it is a gradual process, like Lisa said. Yeah. And, and Lisa, I, I love what you said even about a checklist, because I thought with all my kids, we have the IG. Most of my kids would look at their IG and just do the next thing. And then I made up my own IG for maths and sciences and just filled in those blocks every week. And then they could just follow it. But for this son at 12, I was beating my head against the wall and I prayed, God, I just need help. And he gave me the idea to make him his own daily checklist. So I did it on the computer. It was down, brush your teeth. I'm, I'm not kidding. Like, right. <laughs> make your bed, brush your teeth, do your quiet time. Okay. So we, I had a list. He loved that. You check everything off of that list. Then you're free to your day. Is is good. Good. Yes. <laughs> Minecraft, whatever it is. So check that list off. And if something wasn't checked off, and of course, I'm going to make sure that he actually has done what he said he did. But that was a game changer for my son. Somewhere in the fourth to sixth grade range, depending on the maturity level of my child, whichever one I was working with, I did something very similar on the computer in an Excel spreadsheet. I created a very simple schedule and it included things like brush your teeth, make your bed, do math pages, whatever. And in each one of those blocks, I would put a little note, if you need help, come, come see mom. But they, they either had the option to check it off or they could color in the square or I could buy smiley stickers and they could put a smiley sticker in when it was done. And at the end of the week, that's where that, that motivational reward came in. Here, mom, is my week's worth of finished work. Um, and then I would say, you know, all the cheerleading type things that you can say to your kids. And then let's go do something special. Let's go get ice cream together or you can have your friend over or whatever it was. But it does depend on the child's maturity level. And you are actually at that moment, you are teaching and modeling a skill that they'll need way more than they'll need to check every box that they've learned about every single person in history. This skill of making a list and following it. That is true learning and truly helpful. I know when my kids, two of them that went to college, um, they're big into this, like all on their own. They just absorbed it. And my daughter like, no, I want a paper planner and I map out my week. Where did she learn that? From years of going to her Sunlight IG. I'm so thankful for that skill, if nothing else. It's been huge for her. It was the yeah. biggest thing that my my daughter, my oldest daughter in her freshman year of college thanked yes. me for teaching her. Yes. One of first semester, she was in a group project and they had to accomplish this by this date. And she kept coming to me and saying, mom, these kids are waiting till the day before yeah. to get this. They have no concept of what it means to manage their time. Yep. Yep. And that absolutely is as big a skill as teaching any other subject. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the time management is huge. And I kind of leave that up to my kids. We start small and it might be like, here's your math lesson, do this. If they do it in 10 minutes, then they can go play. If they take five hours, that's on them. <laughs> and so I kind of start very small with that. And it is funny because my kids are different and one will dilly dally more and the other one wants to you know, keep moving. I think it's also important to remember that when you're homeschooling, your child can get up and move around and still get things accomplished. I know yes. my son is very physical and likes to be jumping and moving and bouncing around. And he might be standing at the table writing a math problem and then he'll like jump and turn in a circle and then he'll like do his next math problem. So he's still getting work done it just may not look like it if you just walk into the room. So I think being aware of that with your kids and letting them work the way that they need to. And if they need to move, you know, that that helps get them on that independent path. Mm -hmm. Now, what about kids fighting? If you have more than one child, we have some that are kind of scared to homeschool because now their kids are around each other all the time. How do you handle that if they are fighting all the time or, you know, how do you get things done when that's happening? And by the way, your kids are not unusual if they do. Yeah. Um, that's That also is a skill. Managing my opinion is different than your opinion. And so how do we manage that? Do we roll on the floor and beat each other up? Or do we figure out a way to work through that? And that is absolutely a skill that you need to teach your kids. 
But you also need to remember that you're the adult. So you get to be in control and and you get to decide. But but the idea is that you help them work through that. And there were many, many times where my kids, you know, their own stubborn spirit. Nope, I'm not giving in. I'm not compromising. And so my response was, okay, well, this is not affecting me. This is affecting you. And I really don't have time for this to keep upsetting our routine. So here's the bottom line. I'm about to make a decision. You had your chance to resolve this together. Since you couldn't, I, the mediator, am now stepping in. And this is the final decision. And then we moved on to something else. And let me say, too, I think with multiples, the, being proactive is helpful, too, right? If you're with another person, if I'm nine and my sister's seven and we're together for four hours straight, that's going to be a problem. So try not to do that. Um, I would spread out in the house, too. So if one child was doing math at the dining room table, another was doing their reading or we were doing science in the living room and another was OK. So we so split them up. Don't force them you know, if they're sitting next to each other at the table, probably a bad idea. Put them at separate ends or whatever. Sometimes I'll have somebody at the island, someone at the table, someone at the, okay. So that's one proactive thing to, to split them up actually location wise, I think is super helpful. The other thing um, we had to do, and this isn't going to apply to everyone. Um, I was really into my kids are going to share a room, you know, so my oldest two daughters would share a room and my younger two sons would share a room and that was going to be really good for them. And it's going to teach them all sorts of life lessons. Um, after they were in like sixth, seventh grade, my oldest, I decided, you know what, my kids are together all the time. We share this 2,500 square foot house or smaller some years um, to force them to be in a bedroom together. I just felt like it was stifling for them. And so we had enough room that we could give them their own bedroom. Um, that was helpful because so if you have the space to do that, you might want to consider it um, and just think about how you might feel as a 12 year old if you were with your sister and brother all day long and then had to be with them. But you just didn't have any place to go that was your own. So that, that helped me. I don't know. That might help another family too. I think the other thing that's helpful is to um, make sure your kids know what you expect. I mean, when you start a job, your employer tells you what your job description is and, and your employer doesn't come in day after day and change the rules every day. And so there are certain expectations that you have in your household. This is what I expect in this situation. This is what I expect in this situation make sure that that's clear to your kids. It's not fair to them if they don't know what your expectation is and then they get disciplined for, um, you know, going outside of those lines that in your mind you've drawn, but you've never communicated them. So they have to know what you expect. I think it's important um, to realize too, if you're, if that's an issue that's preventing homeschooling or affecting your homeschooling, it's okay to pause homeschooling while you work on whatever character issue that is that is causing that because um i know for for us i mean my kids know at root we are evil sinful people and left unchecked we like judy said we want to be stubborn and hold the line and have our own way mm -hmm. and so if if that is the conflict then perhaps it's you know, better to say, you know what, we don't need to know what George Washington did. We need to know what God says about our stubbornness and our our want to have our own way. So we're going to talk about that and we're going to work through that first. And then we can, because truthfully, it doesn't matter what you're talking about. If everyone's in conflict, nobody is learning anything, math, history, science, whatever. So there were days that that was school. <laughs> school was, we're yes. going to figure out the word says that you should consider others better than yourselves. How do we make that work? And, mm -hmm. and we called it the Fountain Family Fun House. It wasn't always fun, but how do we make that work at the Fountain Family Fun House? <laughs> that your sister, you consider her to be better than you. And sometimes it was 
mom considers dad to be better than herself. Um, how, how can I make that work? So don't be afraid to work on that instead of math. It's okay. And think, and think about, I mean, you're teaching the skill of conflict resolution. Mm -hmm. Okay, look, my kids can learn about math anywhere. They can learn about history anywhere. I am in a unique position to train them on how to conflict have conflict resolution. How many kids go off to college and don't know that skill? Okay, so here we are in a home with multiples. Ah, why do I have to deal with this all the time? Well, maybe that's why. Maybe God wants to give you lots of opportunities <laughs> to, to model for your children, like Lisa was saying, your own sin, but to, to teach them, no, this is what you do. You admit you did something wrong and you ask very specifically for forgiveness and you extend forgiveness. That whole process is beautiful. And that's something they're going to take into college and marriage and to their deathbed, I hope. Um, what an amazing opportunity that we probably wouldn't have at the level that we do have because we homeschool. And sometimes it's it's simply a matter of starting the day off with some physical activity. Yeah. Um, you know, especially if you've got kids that are wiggly, those kinesthetic learners, you can't expect them to sit down right after breakfast and be focused and available to learn. And so there were some times with my um, son who was the most wiggly, and even now with my oldest grandson, okay, out the door we go, run around the house three times, let's come back inside. And they're like, okay, now I can focus. Yeah. And a lot of times it's as simple as providing some physical activity. Yeah. Yeah, that is so true. Thank you so much, ladies, for being here and for encouraging everyone. We are running short on time, so we are going to wrap up. But to everyone who asked your questions, thank you so much for that. Hopefully, we were able to answer them for you. If you need some more personalized or individual information, though, please reach out to our advisors. Um, their information is on our Sunlight website or our mentors are available in our app and in our Sunlight Connections Facebook group. So you can definitely get more help on those questions if we didn't quite make them uh, or make it to them today. But we do wanna remind you that you are capable of giving your kids an amazing education when you homeschool. And it won't always be easy, but it can be done. And I think the four of us absolutely agree that it's so worth it. Um, and you do get to teach them things beyond those academic subjects. So you've got this. Thanks, Just a reminder that there are also, these will be available for replay. Yes. So if, yes. if so this moves so that. fast, that you <laughs> get everything, um, mm -hmm. watch your email and the link will come to you and the replay will be available for 30 days. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. So if you miss a session or want to reference it again, you can come back and see that. Thanks, ladies. Bye. Bye.